So that's uh, that's all from me. So yeah, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I will just set a quick timer here so that I don't go over. Um, okay. So hello, everyone. First of all, thank you for inviting me, Alexi. I think um, it's a very interesting community, Data Talks Club, and I'm happy to be uh, presenting a bit of the work that we are doing at MindsDB. So thanks for the being title here. Of... Sorry? <laughs> thanks for being here. Sorry, I'm not interrupting yeah. you. I'm shutting up. No, 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 don't worry. Thank you. Um, so the, the title of the talk is Effective Machine Learning Inside Your Database. Um, it's essentially going to be a very sort of quick introduction to the possibilities that doing machine learning within the database or as close to your data layer as possible, um, like essentially what benefits does that bring you? How does it look? Because there's a few um, solutions out there apart from MySDB that try and do the same thing. So we'll give you like our flavor of it. Um, as Alexei was saying, it's very much a hands-on sort of workshop tutorial. So um, first of all, like, we have a comprehensive agenda where even though you had our CEO, CEO here a while back, um, I realized maybe not everyone has a notion of what in database machine learning means. So we'll just go through the concepts quickly, um, then have a very quick demo on the Iris data set, which is kind of the hello world of machine learning. And then we'll def, uh, delve a bit deeper into the AutoML side of things what declarative ML is, um, what parts of the pipeline we're automating, how you can customize it uh, by either modifying or adding new blocks. Um, again, the key benefits of this approach, then a bunch of demos covering pretty much the three main use cases for which you can uh, deploy MindsDB and do supervised machine learning. And then finally, a very interesting section on how you can extend MindsDB because it's an open source project. We are very much a community, much like Data Talks Club, um, where we're trying all the time to you know, foster a place where people can experiment with machine learning, bring in their favorite databases. And we're soon to be opening a, actually a contest on bringing other machine learning frameworks. So we'll also have a short demo that showcases how this can be done. Um, in terms of how to follow and how to get your hands dirty, I guess, with, with the demo, you can go to cloud.mystb.com. I think Alexei has um, yes, I just shared. put it in the description. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you can go there, and I can sh like show you very quickly how that looks. I think if I just make a new incognito tab here, and you go to cloud.mystb.com. Um, it will ask you for a few details and you will get a 30 day free trial. Um, this is sort of the production ready version of MySDB. We handle all the, you know, the instances, the compute that you need for, for predictions behind the scenes. But again, it's an open source project. So if you want, you can just download it locally, deploy it locally, and you'll be able to follow the examples as well. So that is also a request uh, from the audience. If you can say a few words about yourself and introduce yourself, oh. because I didn't do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can say of a course. few words about this. Of course. So let's see. I have been with MyCV for a bit over two years now. Uh, my profile is um, well. I did a an undergrad on robotics engineering here in Chile, which is where I'm based, usually. Um, and then the master's degree, I did it on cognitive robotics. So essentially applied machine learning in robotics where um, in particular, I was focused on how do you align natural language instructions with a map within like a map or a, an inside environment within uh, or where you want the robot to navigate, right? So um, this was before transformers really hit the scene, but uh, I was, mainly concerned with exploring architectures, like deep neural network architectures that were doing a good job of translating commands to a robot, something like, please go out of the, the room, uh, fetch me a water bottle and bring it back, something like that. And that would be translated into high level instructions um, to be executed robustly. So that's my background in terms of you know my um, 
my academic background, I also have a bit of research interest into recommender systems. I have a couple of papers on that with, with uh, the research group back at my university. And um, ever since I entered the industry, the ML industry, I've also developed a, a taste for model calibration. So how do you guarantee that the confidence in your predictions actually matches the empirical rate of, let's say, correct uh, predictions? And time series forecasting as well is very interesting to me right now. So that's, yeah, those are a few words about my research profile. And um, if you want to ask me any questions, I would be happy to get them either through my email or maybe Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. No problem. I think then we can start with the actual content. And as mentioned before, I will just briefly go through what MindsDB is, uh, in case some of you guys haven't seen the, the previous session with Jorge. So MindsDB is an open source project that is all about democratizing machine learning access, right? Um, the way that we try and achieve this is via a series of, let's say, interconnected projects that work in tandem to offer, let's say, the, the, the all-in-one solution, which is the MindsDB product that you can check out in the cloud or locally. Um, it's an open source project, so everything we do is transparent and, and, and uh, free for everyone there to see and contribute back to, which is super empowering as, as an individual contrib contributor. And the let's say the ingredients for this really are based on how do we see or how do we envision the life cycle of a typical machine learning project? Now, MLOps is the term that I'm sure many of you in the community are aware of. Um, it's fairly recent. We're all sort of figuring it out, uh, trying to understand what's the optimal way to um, deploy models, right? And the very first issue that we, you know, I think right off the bat figured out is that a lot of the applied machine learning projects are approached as PhD thesis, right, or master thesis, where you really focus on both preparation and modeling. So like the upper half here, and maybe these two blocks down here, like where you validate the model and ensemble the model, if, if that's what you want. Um, the problem really has to do with the way that you do this. It's usually brittle, right? And it's usually not robust enough. So the transition from where you have a model that you think, okay, is performing at the standards you want, um, has the characteristics that solve the problem you're after. When you want to pass this into some sort of software uh, solution that actually solves the problem in, a, in an efficient way, fast and complying with all requirements, it's actually tough. And it's tough because it's unpredictably expensive. Why so? Well, because it um, usually given the structure in which the upper half is developed, you start creating different pathways of data flow. So for example, you get data from a database, you extract, transform, and load, um, maybe two different solutions, and then you go back to the Jupyter notebook, and then maybe you can go back and, and store some data into some other database. So it becomes a mess, right? It can become a mess quite quickly. If you know what you're doing, it's manageable, but there's a risk here. And essentially, the vision we have is that when it comes to applied machine learning, we should be really thinking about a tight knit integration of the models to where the data lives because models without data mean nothing, right? You need the data for that, uh, for that model to happen. So let's just start where the data lives. And in most cases, it turns out that databases um, are already there and they have existed for quite a while. They are performant. They have a lot of features and there's a lot of different vendors depending on the type of business you have or the type of um, yeah, endeavor you're after. And we think that even, even stuff like feature engineering can be done uh, if you have, for example, a relational SQL database, quite a lot of feature engineering can be done already in the database. Not everything, right? But it can get you a, a lot of mileage out of it. So um, in that sense, your database can be a tool for preparing. You can clearly acquire data from it you can, to some extent, clean and label data and then do some feature engineering. So then we thought, okay, well, the next block is 
the actual modeling process. What if we went after this and found a way to make it happen from within SQL, right? This is the concept uh, of an AI table. Um, that's at least the name we have for it. And essentially um, it enables you to sort of close the entire loop quite seamlessly and in an elegant way, because if you think of machine learning models as data tables, um, they are kind of already deployed. They already exist in your data schema uh, for, for monitoring and like versioning. You know, you have a different version of each table. Maybe you um, drop them usually or retrain at some cadence and you just replace those tables. So you, you sort of have a, a basic type of deployment already there for free just because of this abstraction. And then it brings together the loop in a very nice way. Um, we're still figuring out, you know, extra features and ways of improving, you know, the, the deployment and, and making it be truly, truly even better than, than your uh, normal way of deploying models. Um, again, it's an active project, but the idea and the vision is that you, 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 tip, like you just add an AI layer to your database and that's sort of everything you need, right? That's at least the vision that we're working towards. And this sort of leads me to the first demo, which again, will be super simple um, because we will go and do the Iris data set. Now, all the data sets we will go through in this demo, um, well, except for one at the very end, which is just one simple example of a command, but the others, they are all public. So you can actually follow along in, in the cloud uh, editor with me as we go through the tutorial, right? And the only thing you need to do is when you start the cloud, you will see a learning hub button up here that has two tutorials. If you click on any of them, the first step will be to create a database connection, which is this command right here. And you can copy it and then execute it in the editor. So what this is doing is it's creating a data source, well, a database um, that MindsDB can see, and it's using some engine, right? In this case, it's a Postgres engine. Um, a cool thing about being open source is that people can add their own integrations. And a lot of the ones that we support here have been uh, implemented by our awesome community. So um, if you see any, any integration here that you use, you can even try and do that uh, with uh, the tutorial and maybe add your own data that you already have in the database. But anyway, if you execute this, you will create a, con a connection. I uh, it will not work for me because I already have it registered, but this is sort of the first step for you to follow along. Now, as for the data, right? The data is going to live in a specific namespace, which I'll just show you quite quickly here. This is the command to get to the data. And I seem to be having some issues here. Um, some issue with the command. Let me see if I have an invisible token there. Okay, well, I can do it locally. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Let's copy this again. So, and uh, everyone has access to this schema, right? To this example, the yes. demo data home rentals. Exactly, which is why it should be easy for you to follow. I, I'm not sure why this is erroring out on me. One, uh, it may be some sort of invisible token that I have, but I don't think so. So I'll just go local for now. Uh, you guys let me know if the cloud is working. It may be that we have some sort of issue, but I don't think so. Um, Can you make it a bit larger like you had in absolutely. the... Absolutely. Yeah, great. Maybe, great. Maybe there. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so Iris, we all know the Iris data set. It has um, four features that describe a pedal type, right? The task is to predict the type of pedal from those four features. And it's a very easy data set to solve. Um, like any simple machine learning model will be able to solve this one quite easily. So the concept of AI tables is quite uh, simple. You just use a bit of custom syntax that we have implemented. Again, there's other options for, for this to do like in database machine learning, this is our syntax. So it may be different in other options, but you create a predictor from the example database and then you pass a select data query, which is where you would pass a query that leads to your training data set, right? 
In this case, we'll just go simple and we will select everything from this table like this. And the only thing we need to do here, well, the minimum uh, amount of things we need to do is just point the predictor to the column we want to predict. And in this case, uh, we just want to predict the pedal type. So this is a this is a query that's good enough to whoops um, to predict. But I am not sure why it's not working. Let me see if I'm missing something here. Um, yeah, I am missing the namespace for the model. So like I forgot to add a name for the model. Like this is just me being. Uh, dumb right now, but let's just say we have a model called Iris Demo. And um, we eliminate this. And there we go. This should work. OK. So behind the scenes, a lot of stuff is going to happen. Um, a predictor is going to get generated automatically in a declarative way, which is what we will uh, go into in a, in a bit. You can. In terms of versioning, you can just select the status of the predictor from the predictors table in the MindsDB um, database, right? And you can, of course, specify uh, the name. So where name equals this. And it will show you a few things. It will show you what it's trying to predict. Once it's ready, the accuracy will pop up. Same with the status. You can see it's training and the version. So. Again, a way to version your models for free when you consider them to be tables. Um, let me quickly see if I can access a pre-trained variant that I have in the cloud, because this will take less than a minute, but maybe we can just get it working here. Hmm. Yeah, I know. I seem to have an issue with cloud. Maybe it's because I logged in from the People uh, in the chat say that cloud works fine. OK, so this is very it's interesting. just you. Yeah. Interesting and not convenient. OK, there it worked. Um, just once again. Ah, I may be having the wrong name here. OK, I have a bunch of models here. OK, cool. It's working now. I'm not sure what happened there, but um, we can generate predictions out of those predictors that we train. So the way to do this, if you will just let me go to my cheat sheet here and find the command. Um, I have a lot of commands here. So the way you do this is you essentially select the column that you want to predict. So pedal type, right? From the relevant MindsDB predictor, which was called MindsDB.iris something. I have it here somewhere. Um, I can actually sort by version. And I have a few of them that are pre-trained just in case that, you know, um, I wanted to quickly get results. And you can specify synth synthetic parameters, essentially. So if you go back to the data, right? And let's, let's think, this is again a bit of, um, it's a bit of cheating because we're using like training data points, but let's imagine a different data point that's kind of close to the ones we have in training. So let's say that the sepal length uh, will be five and sepal width will be something close, three. Same with the length of the pedal. So this, uh, this flower does not exist in the database, right? So you're just yeah making this yeah. up, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a, a different data point so that we're not you know, cheating because it's in the training data set. Um, it predicts Satosa. I'm guessing that's an, a decent answer. Um, you can change parameters here to get a new prediction. This is the way that you get uh, one off predictions, but you can also bulk predict when you join the data with the table, right? So again, this is not going to be good practice, but we can just take the training data join it with the model and like one second and just get the predictions like i think we can access the original one like this maybe we will put an alias to the model like m 
the table will be T. That way we can do this model dot pedal type model dot original. And there you have, you know, the predictions with the actual values. And if we scroll, well, it's pretty much a perfect one. And again, this is with the training data set. So it's a bit of a cheat, but you can create views to have training splits, testing splits, and then do the same process. So that's a very quick introduction to AI tables. We'll go to more interesting examples in just a second. But what, what is... happens if you don't specify one of the features? Like in your example? Yeah. Uh, so well, what happens there? So it truly depends on the backend that you're using, the, the machine learning backend that you're using. Uh, up here where we, well, we don't have the command. It, it's on the cloud. Sorry, it's on the local version. But here where we create the predictor, when you're saying you want a MindsDB predictor, under the scenes, this is renaming to our own AutoML syntax, uh, sorry, package. So it's truly using Lightwood, which is a um, flexible engine that is able to cope with missing data. So if you were to remove one, you would still get a prediction. It, uh, in the process of generating the predictor, it figures out in the model how to cope with missing data. Um, there's a few techniques for this. Most typically for, for like neural networks, it uses dropout um, and that helps cope a bit with it. But it depends on the backend. And we'll see at the end of the talk how you can use different backends for this. Um, so it could be that, I don't know, for example, you would use something like a scikit-learn connection that was contributed by someone in the open source community. And maybe that integration is not able to deal with missing values. So it kind of depends on which integration you're using, really. Mm -hmm. But by default, it's robust. And maybe I'm trying to go a bit ahead. Uh, but there is a mm -hmm. question from Adam about how to train test split. Is it something you want to cover in other demos? So um, we will cover it in two ways. The first one is within the AutoML package, this is being done automatically. And then up in, in the SQL level, you can also create views for you to handle and automatically like hold out some data and have a hard guarantee that this is not even entering the DML framework. Mm. So it's going to be covered, yeah. Thank you. No problem, okay. Moving back to the slide uh, deck. So mine's to be, and now we'll be doing a bit of a double click and getting a bit more of the detail on what's happening. But to recap, we're solving three main pain points in the, in the life cycle of DML projects. So the first one is simplifying ML ops. So making sure that deployment sort of comes for free with the abstraction of AI tables, you just query them. You won't be after exact matches of rows you already have in the database. You will be interpolating values or you can even be creating new columns um, depending on the type of model. You can also forecast, right? So it's, um, it's an abstraction that simplifies ML ops when it comes to deployment uh, in a quick way, right? The second point is how do you integrate state-of-the-art ML, how to use it in a simple way. That's our AutoML framework, Lightwood. Uh, it abstracts a lot of the data pipeline, well, the, the ML pipeline from data preparation all the way to model building and even like model analysis and interpretability. And then finally, a sort of an intermediate step for users that are not necessarily wanting to the, like to write their own state of the art, but more like use it in a simple way, just state things uh, and they will happen. That's where JSON AI comes in. And it's a, an, an intermediate representation for machine learning models. And it's declarative in the sense that the framework will figure out what to do based on what you're asking to happen, right? Um, the cool thing here is you can arbitrarily customize the model internals without having to code. And this opens up the door for people who are not experts in Python, for example, or whatever other language for machine learning that you may want to use. Um, and they can just interact with the document. This will compile to a Python predictor and then that will work. That's sort of the, the interesting twist here. Now, if we delve into the first new component, so the state-of-the-art machine learning how Lightwood works, how we do automated machine learning. Well, the answer is that it's a very flexible sort of ML, ML system. It has a core that's very flexible, but I would not say it's focused on the typical AutoML paradigm where you sort of trade off time for compute power 
where you would say something like, okay, let's, I have four GPUs in my cluster. Let's run them for a month to find out the optimal hyperparameters for this type of model. We're more like, and this is just the current state of things, but we're more like, we have a series of strong opinions on how to do an efficient, good enough model that you can easily customize. And we do have some bits of hyperparameter optimization, but it's not our, let's say, focus. We're more focused on just, you know, getting a model to work that you can be transparent about and know what's happening under the hood. The way we're doing this is, and I will go back to the previous diagram, but pretty much we're inferring types from the database, like whatever data query you're sending, we're taking a look at that data and figuring out what's the optimal way to treat it in terms of machine learning models. A clear example would be you have a numerical feature that only has really like three values. And for that, it may be better to just consider it to be a category, right? Um, here's another example where you have like a categorical spending score column. And in this case, it's clear it's a categorical sort of uh, type. And based on that, we will dispatch it to the corresponding encoder that will generate a uh, feature representation that's ideally, uh, this is the hope at least, better suited for a model that's downstream to learn from. And this model is what you see here on step number three, where you concatenate all the features and you train some models to learn to predict whatever you're after. Um, there's ensembling mechanisms afterwards, but we'll go over that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bit. So going back to the diagram here, uh, the key concept is you have a bunch of encoders, right, that are specialized on different data types, and those get fed into the mixer. And here's where the mixer is where you can go crazy. You can implement transformers, RNNs, uh, of course, like DBM, XGBoost, uh, random forests. You can go very simple, very complex at the same time. And to go back from that intermediate representation space to the original uh, answer space, you just decode back whatever answer you get. Uh, and this is a very flexible approach. Like we, you'll see, we have a lot of um, offerings already and the community is helping us get better by each day that, that passes. Now, in terms of transparency, the JSON AI object uh, that gets generated comes from within the problem definition, which is what the user asks to predict. In truth, the only thing you need to specify is the target column, as we saw in the first example. And this will generate an entire JSON AI file, which will have encoders, it will have uh, the model, uh, the type of ensemble, which functions or metrics to use to validate the accuracy. So it's quite involved and you can arbitrarily change it from both SQL and Python if that's what you want, uh, in order to generate a Python file that you can then store and save on your own. You can let the cloud handle it or, or the local MindsDB installation to handle it. But essentially you have as an artifact, both the weights and the generated code. Um, so just an example of some of the high level keys we have on a JSON AI object, you've got the encoders that include the inferred data types, the encoder dispatch. Um, you've got the models, which include the, like how to mix this information, how to ensemble those predictors then the main bit is the problem definition where you specify stuff like what's your time budget? What's the random seed that controls the entire process? What columns do you just want to flat out ignore? If by some chance you included them from SQL, you can ignore them here. Um, and then what one of the users, or sorry, the, the, the viewers was asking for, you've got both a cleaner method and an, a splitter method. Now to clean, you can actually specify different types of imputing uh, procedures for different columns if you have missing data. You can also specify different types of splitting. So you can do stratified splitting, you can do normal splitting. Um, for time series, we have an actually like a, let's say um, a unique way, like once the JSON AI file figures out this is a time series problem, the splitter is a different module altogether. Um, and this all happens automatically. So you can definitely customize this. We've got uh, tutorials on it in the documentation page for this. Um, so you can like feel free to explore it on your own and, and like implement new splitters if, if that's what you're after. Um, we got other modules as well, like analysis, explainability, uh, well, the aforementioned time series. So certainly a lot of them. In terms of the encoders, right? We have more than 20 options. 
Um, for mixers, we have more than 10. It includes neural networks, gradient boosting, the usual suspects, let's say. Um, for ensembling, you have a few of them, like five options, roughly speaking. You can stack models. You can just naively take the mean or the mode if it's a category, or you can just simply select the best model as well. And then for analysis, we have interesting propositions. Like, of course, you get to validate the accuracy on a held out portion of the data, but then we also do uh, interesting stuff. For example, we provide uh, row level attribution with SHAP. We get the global feature importance through permutation feature importance technique. Um, and then we also uh, build a model agnostic confidence metric using conformal prediction, which is a very powerful technique. So there's a lot of analysis for the model that comes out uh, that's happening automatically, and it helps improve both the trust of the user on the AutoML model, but also when you actually run predictions, you get more insights on what's exactly happening for that particular prediction. So going back a bit to you know, what's the benefit of this way of doing things? Um, this is a paper that came out literally like four or five days ago, and it's actually very relevant. Um, they talk about uh, the, the key factors that they observe after interviewing a bunch of uh, machine learning engineers. What are the factors that they, they see um, point to a successful machine learning project? And three of them are velocity, validation, and versioning. And it turns out with this stack, like the, the concept of AutoML that's exposed through SQL, you get quick iteration that can be done not only by your machine learning experts, but also by data analysts or even uh, people that are not computer scientists at all. You can validate quite quickly because you've got, um, let's say, evaluation on your held out data set for free. And then finally, the versioning is also trivial because it's just a table and you can organize your tables as usual. So that's kind of the, the detail of what's happening. Now we'll take a look at it happening real time in the cloud. So let me just uh, go back here and let's start again. So let me just remove this. We will have three use cases. Um, we'll see two of them first, then we'll do a small uh, throwback to the, to the slides and come back. So the data sets we'll be taking a look at here are called uh, telco churn which we'll take a look at quickly here. It's a series of records for different customers with some properties that describe them, um, whether they have uh, you know, telecommunications, right? Whether they have phone service, uh, multiple lines, internet service, and so on. And then at the end, a very nice uh, self-descriptive column called churn, whether they churn or not after some time. So this is one data set, and we will be looking at predicting this column. And then the second data set, is going to have to do, it's a regression task and it's called, the table's called used car price, where we have a lot of records for Audi cars, they are used. So you've got a year of manufacture, you, you've got the price at which it's sold, um, transmission mileage, fuel type, and so on. And in this case, we want to predict the price. So imagine you're in the market, well, not sure how to say this one, but you want to sell your car and you're expecting to see an, like an idea of how much it's worth. Well, you, you would train the predictor and then find out like what the predictor thinks, which is a very convoluted and computer science-y way of doing it, but you can, so why not, right? Um, so the twist here is that we'll start adding a few um, customization options. For the churn model, what we'll do is um, we actually want to impute values in one of the columns. So I think it, it is um, the total charges column that has a few missing values, right? And so we want to specify for the AutoML backend uh, a way to impute those so that the process of learning is uh, better suited to the reality, right? Maybe we just want to take the mean or maybe we want to impute a zero here. Um, regardless, the way of doing it, it's it's actually quite simple. Let's briefly go to the learning hub and copy the command to train a model to avoid slow typing. Um, in this case, we'll just uh, choose another name for the predictor. I think UCP for, sorry, uh, telco 
for this data set is fine. So let's say telco model. Um, we have to pick the right data set, of course, uh, the right data query, select data query. And then we want to predict churn, right? However, we want to impute values for total charges. And here's where we have a bit of syntax that controls the mapping from the, the database, right? Back to the JSON AI object. This syntax is called using. And the idea is that you can control the values of all the top level keys in that JSON file. And you can directly specify them to override whatever the automated process com comes up with. So if I go, go to my um, handy command list here, we can do something like this one where we specify the imputer's key. Uh, can you see all right, Alexi? Should I? OK. So the imputer's key will be equal to a list right, of objects. And this is the typical um, AutoML block that we work with. You define the name of the module, and then you define the arguments that pass to it. And so in this case, what we'll do is we'll uh, specify a numerical imputer for the total charges column and we'll be setting the missing values at zero. It could be mean as well. It could be a precise quantity, but we'll just go simple with zero. And this is enough for the predictor to change its recipe or composition. And um, we'll get it to train. Um, I already have a pre-trained version, so we don't have to wait. But after a while, it will... Just curious, how would it look like if there are two if we want to impute apply this imputator to two or apply two different imputators to two different columns yeah something like this so you ah, would, right you would maybe if it were a category categorical right and then maybe you just want the mode mm -hmm. and the target would be i don't know has telephone or something mm -hmm. kind of looks like that mm -hmm. um and this funny quotes is because you kind of want to tell it that it's a string right yeah yeah this is something we're improving um you mean you mean the like yeah double, like yeah. exactly yeah this is something we're improving python is not the best language at metaprogramming so we have to do a few hacks here and there for it to work um but we're streamlining streamlining the design hopefully it will be you know in the short future you will be able to do this um but it's so one it of the uses python under the hood yes for this thing okay interesting yes. Yes, because I mean, at the end of the day, we want to leverage the entire stack of PyTorch, um, mm -hmm. you know, scikit-learn and all the nice stuff it has going on. So we've thought about changing the, the, the bit of code that actually does the metaprogramming and injection of, of JSON keys into something that's better suited for it. Um, but I don't want to promise anything just in case. <laughs> so one command that is useful here is describe. And I want to show it to you just because we can quickly check that um, uh, this is not yet trained. So let me just go find a pre-trained version. Select everything from the predictors table, minus db. Um, I'll just sort by version. I want to find the one that's already pre-trained, this one, because I wanted to show you that if we describe it with the ensemble key, uh, may not be the most descriptive one, but it shows you actually the entire JSON AI file that gets generated. So you can actually see here what's the encoders that got uh, inferred from the data. So for the churn column, it's a binary encoder that is the target. Uh, it's got some target weights that come from a statistical analysis phase that is executed down the line. And then if you scroll down a bit, and again, it's a sort of a large JSON AI because of the amount of columns, um, you will see a key for imputers. And here we have um, you know, the syntax that we introduced when training the model. So again, this gets generated. And then this, in turn, generates a Python predictor that's the one that's training at the end. So just, again, an example of how you can easily customize what's happening under the scenes and get a bit more control. Even if you don't necessarily have uh, coding abilities, you can control how the, the workflow sort of, yeah, is. Um, 
Okay, so I think I'll just show you the predictor working, but I will use the pre-trained one because I'm not sure we will get this one ready in time. Let's just check if it finished. Nope, hasn't finished. There's no records yet. So um, we can quickly go and fetch here an artificial data point. So we're selecting the churn and then the churn confidence, right? From the pre-trained model, very important. Uh, and we're specifying a data point. You will notice not all the columns are here. So it's working to, to like figure out the most, uh, how to cope with that. And it's saying it will not churn with 88% confidence. And I mean, sounds like a sensible answer for a male with no dependents and $70 in monthly charges. So like that's one example of how this predictor with that imputer is actually working. And um, again, you can bulk predict for that. I want to give you an example of how you can create like a testing training split at the SQL level. The way to do that is to create a view, right? We'll again do a view that's maybe not the best one in terms of machine learning procedures, but it will give you a glimpse on how to do it. Essentially, the syntax is you create a view with some name, you go to your integration, in this case, example DB, and then you specify the query. So here we're just like selecting 30 data points from the table. And this is something that, I mean, this bit of syntax gets expanded all the time. So we'll be working on, you know, bits of random sampling and, and stuff that people ask for within SQL, like agnostic to the ML framework. Um, so this is something that you can expect to get better over time. Now, once the view is created, you can just, again, bulk predict by joining the predictor with the table. In this case, the view, right? So you're selecting the churn of the model, uh, the original churn as the truth, right? Um, once again, I need to add the pre-trained um, specifier here. And we're selecting, we're asking to join the predictor with the view that contains our held out quote unquote data. And um, this will give you a table with 30 records for the prediction and then the, the true value if you have it, right? So there's some mismatches. The predictor is not perfect, but that's the example of the workflow. Of course, you can also uh, just include mcharn underscore score, right? And then it would give the probability, right? Yeah, 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 you're right. Um, because this are, there's actually, I think, m dot churn explain as well, um, which gives you a dictionary of like predicted value, the confidence, whether mm -hmm. it's an anomaly, what's the per class probability. So like no, 12%, yes, 87%. And this dictionary changes depending on the type of task. If it's a time series task, you will have different insights here. So yeah, and it's a JSON. So in some backends, in some databases, you can actually process it from within it. Um, so you can extract things from here. Mm -hmm. So that's the first example. I just, just want to... curious. I think you probably have, uh, maybe you will show it. Well, let's say if I want to compute something like RC, uh, AUC thing, like AUC score. Uh, 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 sorry, a what? Like uh, some sort of performance, oh, metric, AUC. for example, AUC. Yeah. yeah. Like, is it yeah. a one line thing? It's something like this. Using accuracy functions equals, for example, AUC score. Uh -huh. We support, again, this is dependent on the on the ML backend. For now, we want to make it one level up so that it's agnostic to the ML backend. But right now, it supports all the scikit-learn metrics for supervised uh, learning. So you could do like R2 score. You could do, uh, whoops, sorry about that. You could do um, balanced accuracy score, normal accuracy score, um, precision recall whatever you you're after mm -hmm. and it can be more than one as well you can do That's something cool. like well accuracy score and then precision and this will run both of them it will report both of them and you will have a better idea of mm -hmm. um, of how that works so that's the first example just to close it out the accuracy that it got in this case um was a 77.5% and the metric as you were asking, we can get it if we do, I think 
describe um, describe sorry describe uh, minus b dot this right here. Hmm. There's a bit of syntax for it. I can't quite hear this. So if you ask to describe the model, it will tell you what like what are the sub models that were trained, how long it took, which one's the best model and got selected. If that's the type of uh, ensemble you're using, of course. And then what's the balance sorry, the accuracy function that got selected. So in this case, balanced accuracy score. And uh, I probably you will talk about this. Uh, there is a question like, is it a question from Eric? Is it possible to show the models that are generated? I think you just showed this, but uh, maybe the question is also like uh, export the model. So you, you train this like GBM, but then mm -hmm. uh, probably it will be part number four, right? When you will show us how to export the model from, from my um, So I will not directly show it. Uh -huh. I can give you an example. Well, I can, I can tell you what happens. So when you create a predictor, after it's trained, the artifacts that get generated are, again, depends on the backend. But right now for the default one, so Lightwood, right? Um, three things get generated. The weights, which are included in the predictor object, the code, for reproducibility purposes, and then the JSON AI as well, in case you want to have that higher level representation. All those three will get um, stored in the file system under some configuration path that MySDB has, which you can check right now because we're using cloud. Sorry, um, you would not necessarily be able to expose that Python object directly from here, but locally you can. And um, not sure if I have an example right now of the code, but maybe when we're in the Q&A session, I can quickly dig it up and show you guys. Mm -hmm. um, but to close out that question, the artifacts that get stored, if you're locally deploying, you can easily access under the configuration folder that you specify. So, Thank you. so that's um, classification. Now, for the used car prices example, which is, a regression problem, um, whoops, car price, this one. Um, we want to make a bit of a different approach. We want to generate features from the SQL query that we use to train the model, right? Um, for that, let me just, again, copy the query because it's a bit long and um, we will avoid typing. But essentially this is an example of a bit of feature engineering using, using uh, the editor here. So let me just expand this a bit further. Uh, if we go back to the data, right, there's a few things that I personally would like to change for, for predicting my own, let's say, car price. Uh, first of all, I'm not American, so I want to have this on kilometers per liters instead of miles per gallon. Uh, and changing that is actually quite simple. It's just this formula and you just add a, an alias to a new column. And we're sorry, I missed a step. We're creating a view where we're storing those transformations, right? So again, we're selecting from the integration that holds the data. Some of the columns just pass as is, but then some of them will have some transformations. Uh, so the first one we already saw, and then the second one would be, I think it's personally interesting to understand for each type of model and year of manufacturing, how many of them are in the market already. And for that, because this is a Postgres database, right? Whatever is in here is a native query that gets sent to the database, executed, and then we just parse it back. So in this case, we're using a window function where we partition the data set over the model in the year, and we take the count. So we know how many models um, per year are in the market, right? And if we execute this view, uh, we can then select from it as per usual, just select everything from views.ucp view. And uh, now we have those like bits of, um, if I can expand it here, we have those bits of like feature engineering of sorts. So we now have kilometers per liter. And then in this case, we're seeing it's sorted by units to sell. So we have just one uh, A1 model made on the year 2010. For year 2011, it's five of them and you can see them here and so on. It goes beyond those uh, rows to the 10,000 rows we have in the data set. And uh, this is an example of feature engineering. You can then pass this through to the typical like P 
predictor syntax, right? Like let's generate a predictor here out of that view. Let's call it UCP model. We're selecting data from the view that we just created. We're predicting the price. And in this case, just to explore a few more options for the using syntax, we're specifying an ensemble that for all the models that get trained will just output the mean prediction. And then in terms of analysis, we want, and here's a bit of, um, I guess, insider knowledge once you start getting comfortable with the backend. Um, one of the analysis blocks that gets automatically deployed is the feature importance. However, it has a limit on the amount of rows for scalability reasons. Like sometimes if you input 2 million rows, it will take a while. So by default, the row limit is set at, I think, 5,000. So we're just amping this up so that 10,000 rows make it into this and we can figure out the importance of each feature, right? So here we're specifying custom behavior on post model training uh, sort of pipeline and also at the aggregation level of the sub modules into an ensemble. And again, this will generate a predictor passing through the stages of a JSON AI file, a Python object, which then gets trained and packed into an artifact file that gets stored within your file system. Um, again, this will take a bit to train. So I'll just select from the pre-trained version. But in this case, there's not much to see here. Like it's standard, you know, joint predictions with the data. Um, of course, pre-trained. And, um, and that way you can sort of understand this will be like the residuals for the training data set, like how close they are to the actual value that will also like help you understand if the model is trust, uh, trustworthy or not, apart from all the other sort of um, um, insights that get generated when training. Um, now, this may take a while though. So, so maybe can you tell us what's happening here? Or maybe I will attempt to tell you what's yeah, going sure. on there and you can yeah. tell me if I'm wrong. All right. So you have some data and then you store the model as artifact somewhere. So right now what's happening is you're pulling this data from Postgres, right? So you have the data and then you're taking the model, the artifact, and you do something like predict uh, model dot predict proba, right? And you apply to yeah. this, uh, to this data coming from Postgres, right? And then you return back the original data and then the prediction. Pretty much. Yes. Um, I think um yeah this is still executing but um you're right essentially we offload everything that has to do with data gathering to the database um then that passes using the mysql wire protocol that we have to the back end of the whatever machine learning uh framework we're using uh then it gets predicted with the usual model dot predict notation that everyone's familiar with um, of course, in the particular case of Lightwood, uh, a few extra steps happen to generate those insights and um, explainability, let's say, uh, features. But at the end of it, once you have the data frame with your predictions, our SQL library merges or joins that back into the data. So you can get both predictions and data side by side. Um, so that's what happened here. Like we have the the price original, mileage, confidence, maximum, the predicted price. So you can sort of compare. In this case, it doesn't seem that the predictor is like very, very good, but it gives you a general idea of, of what to expect. And then you've got like everything here, right? So you've got the insights for explaining um, and so on. So essentially you're right. Maybe the one step I haven't really delved into is how we perform the SQL sort of alignment between queries, more on that later. Um, but I think your summary is accurate. That's pretty much what we're doing. So I think that closes out both uh, examples, regression and classification. Um, bit short on time, I think, already. So let me just move over quickly to the slides. You want also to show us a time series example, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that so should that's, be interesting. Yeah, so that's just a bit of extra syntax and functionalities. So to set the scene, this other example I'm going to show you is you're a data analyst at the Chicago Transit Authority. So you're in charge of um, optimally assigning amounts of buses for each route. That's the problem you're tasked with. 
And so you could think of doing this with uh, normal optimization procedures, linear programming, I'm sure it will work, but machine learning sounds like a really great idea if you have a lot of data, which in this case we do. Um, so essentially you would forecast the number of writes per week, per day, per month, maybe. And based on that, you would assign the number of buses, right? Now, this is a pattern of a uh, problem that we see a lot on both customers and users. Uh, and it's actually kind of tough because it's a time series, of course. You have a column that gives you the, uh, like the temporal, like the, the point at which you're, you measured something, the timestamp, the date, uh, the day of week even. Uh, it can be a combination of, of columns. And you've got an associated quantity that you want to forecast, right? But it can also be multivariate. It can be that maybe you want to predict more than one column at the same time. It may be that you just want to leverage those columns as additional input to predict the one column. So it's a weird sort of relationship there. Maybe it's just one series to predict itself. Maybe it's multiple of them to predict just one, or maybe you want to predict all of them based on all of them, right? Uh, so essentially a multivariate problem. And then at the end, we also have the issue of cardinality because you can have multiple partitions, multiple groups. Um, and depending on the type of use case, for example, retail or this very same um, example, you can have hundreds of groups. So hundreds of series for which you want to predict uh, the future and all of them will have different dynamics in time. So that sort of sets the scene. Um, really the only thing I wanna showcase here back in the cloud is uh, the amount of like, well, the custom bits of syntax that you use to forecast as opposed to like normal predictions. So the data we're using here is CTA for Chicago Transit Authority. Again, just five columns. So it's much more simple. Um, you can, uh, let me see. We can maybe take a look at one of them. So like where route equals 11, I think this works. Let's check. Yeah, and let's limit it to 100 data points. So one of the things you can do with the cloud, well, and actually the graphical user interface even locally is to get insights for the data. Um, so like this will give you the distribution of dates. It will give you like, if it's a categorical data, uh, sort of a data type, it will give you like a glance as to whether it's unbalanced or not, then distributions for numerical data and so on. So it's a good way to understand your data set if you haven't done some sort of analysis first. It's a, it's a useful first pass of sorts. And that was the data for just one route. We have hundreds of them, right? So the way to do that is if you just let me go here and find the, the query to avoid typing, you can, um, first of all, think about transformations in the sampling uh, sort of um, transformation because you have daily data, but maybe you want to start broad. Maybe you want to just forecast week by week because it's easier. You don't have to deal with uh, maybe spikes in particular dates for holidays and that sort of gets smoothed out. So it may be simpler. Again, this is a Postgres uh, database. Um, it could even have timescale DB as an integration installed, which is a specialized in time series. The thing is you can actually perform transformations like truncating the date column to get the week, for example. And you can take the sum over that entire week to get um, a weekly sampled sort of time series for all routes. So if we create that view and we then just select everything from it, um, you will see that we have now a timestamp that is much more coarse, right? Just week by week, route by route, you have an amount of passengers. So we want to train with this version first. And when it comes to generating a predictor, um, the syntax is pretty similar. Again, we will be using the default AutoML engine. Uh, we'll just say CDA predictor from example DB, sorry, actually from views. And then we will select everything from this particular view. Now, here's where it changes a bit. You usually just do predict, in this case, sum, right? Um, I realize this is like a reserved keyword, but it will work just fine. Um, 
if we just did this, the automal engine would be like, okay, this is a regression problem. Let's predict the sum based on the route and the week, which is not useful information. So it will probably not be great. Um, however, you can activate forecasts by specifying that you want to order the data set by some column. And if you have partitions, you want to group by them. So what we're saying here is you have a lot of like a bunch of time series that are defined by both the week and the route. And for them, you want to define two parameters, two integers. So on one hand, the window. So for deep learning models that are locally sensitive and they work with windowed contexts, the window parameter defines how many days, how many weeks, how many months to take into account. And the same with the horizon. So if it's a weekly predictor, in this case, maybe we want to look like two months behind to predict the next month. So eight weeks, four weeks, right? And this is pretty much the way that you would train a time series predictor. Now, let me just quickly check here. Yeah, that's fine. So that's the difference when it comes to syntax. And um, yeah, and once again, I have a pre-trained predictor. Um, that I will show you just how it works. Um, should be this one. So the way it works is a bit different. Just one tiny bit of syntax that's special here, which is when you are selecting you know, the forecast, the week and the route, uh, you join the model with the table. But when specifying the filters, you also select or you apply a filter on the date or timestamp column to be larger than the latest. And that will uh, lead you to predictions that are on the edge of the last timestamp that was observed in the query you passed to train. So in this case, I think the predictor should be called, I have, I have a pre-trained predictor, but I'm not, I'm not sure if it's this one. Let me quickly check um, like this. Yeah, there we go. OK, so this is an example, right? Um, so we've got a few null columns there, but uh, null rows. But essentially, you get four, because it's horizon was four. So you get four values uh, that sit on the top of the last point for route 31. And those are the values for the observed um, bus rides. Now, the cool thing here, and if you will let me just quickly jump into a local MindsDB installation, is that you can integrate with a lot of business intelligence tools, in particular, one like Metabase here um, that is connected to my local MindsDB in instance that I have on the console here, both Metabase and MindsDB. You can do stuff like um, writing queries, <laughs> works, <laughs> um, where you union all, right? Like you take the query from a table like the raw, the actuals, let's say, up to some point, then you generate the prediction for what's next with the model being joined with the data, and you union all of them. You take the union. What that does, if you execute this, um, is you get a table with both the, let me just move this one. Oh, it's not working. Well, you get two columns, one with the timestamp, one with the target. And the important bit is that at the very end, you would get dates that are not in the actual data set and they are predicted or imputed by the predictor, right? And that lets you do visualizations. You can quickly communicate this to like stakeholders and whatnot, like people that are interested on the evolution of this. Um, so that's another example of how you can just through SQL integrate with tools that are aware of the language and can use it. And it enables quick visualizations um, to share with other people. Just so, a quick question. So here you just tell uh, Metabase that, hey, there is an instance of PostgreSDB. Connect to it and query it, right? And then it's actually not PostgreS, it's MindDB. It's it, not quite. It's or, two things. It's, so you've got PostgreS, you're right. On one side, uh -huh. you've got PostgreS. And on the other, you've got a database that's MySQL. And it happens uh -huh. to be called MindDB. Like that's uh, right. our library being exposed, as, well, our layer being exposed as a database. And so for Metabase, MySDB is just another database, and you take mm -hmm. the union between both, and this is the output, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's your 
close, but it's more like you have two entities, two different databases. One of them uh, works as a predictor and the other is the actual data. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was close. Uh, I was thinking like, oh, you probably pretend to be something else. Yeah. Which in this case, MySQL. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so that closes out the time series demo very quick and, and short. And now we can go back to the final stage. I think we're right on time. So the final stage is a bit more about you know, exposing the sort of things we've seen to other databases on one hand, but also to other machine learning frameworks. Now, uh, up until I would say last year, we were very much uh, tightly coupled with our own AutoML. And <clears throat> we saw that users were not necessarily super interested into AutoML. They maybe wanted to bring their own models. Maybe they wanted another library. So we came up with a concept called handlers. Now, handlers are a, just a simple abstraction, really, that leverage our package that parses SQL statements and enables integrations with both data layers and predictive frameworks. Now, the key word here is predictive frameworks more than predictive libraries. You would not want a, an integration with PyTorch as a whole. You would want more something that's handling some of the steps that comes of like that come to modeling. So for example, PyTorch forecasting, PyCaret, uh, Auto Scikit-Learn, Teapot. Those are examples of frameworks that we would like to bring in. And we're actually having a contest next month for this. Um, so this sort of works as you know, an introduction to that concept and also an invitation for people that may be interested in participating to know that this is happening. So first of all, a quick primer on MindsDB SQL. This is a package that is behind the scenes of everything we've seen so far. It essentially parses an arbitrary SQL query into an abstract syntax tree, and it then generates a plan with several um, steps that have to be executed in a sequence to work out predictions and inject them into whatever query the user is finally asking for. Now, again, I have a very, very, very quick demo on this. It's a Jupyter notebook with four cells, so I promise it will be short. Um, we have an already formatted abstract syntax tree here in the form of a select query that is selecting column one from table one, predicted from a predicted, uh, like a predictor table, and we want to join that. We want to join it with, on the left-hand side, the table one from integration, int, and then on the right-hand side with the MindsDB predictor with an inner join. And if we compile this, it gives us an abstract syntax tree of type select. Now we can plan for this query given those namespaces. And if you print the steps, this is pretty much what happens behind the scenes of everything we've seen so far. So you get a step that fetches a data frame from the database in the integration int with this query. Um, then it applies the predictor with the result of step zero. Then it joins both results. And finally, it does a projection. So the amount of steps and the type of steps can vary widely depending on what you're trying to do. And the idea for the handler sort of abstraction is that you get to interact with the raw SQL queries, because MindsDB SQL sort of abstracts away all the pain of having to deal with those, format them, figure out what to do. So it's simpler in that sense, right? Now, in short, if you want to add a new, like a support for a new database that we don't currently have, it's as simple as writing a handler, which has a few, like a bunch of methods. It's just one Python class. Um, the community last month did an amazing job. They contributed about 20 or 27, like close to 30 different databases that we didn't have before, or, or even business intelligence tools. Like for example, Metabase was contributed by the community. And, uh, and once you have the requirements for this in your local installation, you can just try it out. Uh, MindsDB should play well with that and you can get predictions to and from, right? And then the, the twist here or the, the new face of the contest which by the way, I think has prize money. So just FYI, um, is that we're bringing new ML frameworks. So again, you just write a handler and you can bring new uh, frameworks that have your favorite models within. So far we have Lightwood, of course. We have another awesome declarative ML library called Ludwig. Um, we're working and nearly close to finishing Hugging Face and we're giving a refresh to MLflow 
and there's a lot more to come on the next couple of months. So one last demo to close this out um, will be on my local installation of MindsDB that I have right here. And we will be taking a look at an integration to another AutoML framework, which is the one that I mentioned just now, Ludwig. Um, the way that this works, I think I have the queries here somewhere. Let me just, yeah, it's very simple. So the only difference really is once you have a Python environment with the required dependencies installed and you start MindsDB, we automatically figure out that that handler is supported and that enables that handler as a namespace, which means you can create a predictor from that namespace. So in this case, Ludwig, right? And we would generate a model with this name from, as usual, the data query that selects your, your rows to predict some column. Uh, of course, I trained the model yesterday just to make sure that this was working and all was good. So let's just quickly drop it and train it again. Um, if you go to the status here, you will see it's training. And if you go to the to the sort of terminal, you will see that this is all Ludwig. So it's a different machine learning backend. It's running its own uh, automated pipeline. It has a different way of creating the model. Long story short, after a while, it will register all the artifacts uh, within the file system. However, the handler specifies it too. Um, actually, it says here it finished training. So if we go back here, we will have a complete predictor with some accuracy. And as before, you can select and generate predictions from it using a different machine learning backend. So this is this goes to show that you know in database machine learning doesn't really have to be tightly coupled with any one particular vendor or like solution. You can really go crazy in terms of parsing the SQL queries and connecting databases with different machine learning solutions. Um, and yeah, like that sort of, I think, closes it out because um, that was the last demo. We now have time, I think, for a Q&A session. Before that, as next steps to close it out, I think the invitation is to get involved. We have a Slack community. We have you know, the GitHub repo with some discussions going on there. Um, we love it when people just contribute ideas, code, or discussions, all helpful, or they're, they're all amazing. It helps us you know, understand where the space is moving to and how we can innovate. Um, you can also start the book and bookmark the repo to download and check it out yourself in a local deployment. Or if you haven't already, you can create a cloud account. Uh, it gets a free 30 day trial and you can experiment there uh, without having to worry about compute resources. Uh, thank you very much for the time. Um, here's my email again, if you wanna ask any other follow-up questions and we can now go to the Q&A, I think. Yeah, and all the links uh, are in the description. Um, I was just wondering, so I was really hoping to see an example with MLflow. Uh, maybe you can show us where we can see it. So I realized that maybe it, we couldn't cover it today, but yeah. uh, I am personally quite curious about that because I think this is like a, like a standard tool for experiment yeah. tracking. And so, many could be interested like how to integrate it in their existing workflows. Right. So we have documentation for this in, <clears throat> let me see if I can share my screen again. So docs.mindsdb.com, um, you have a lot of documentation there. <clears throat> I think MLflow should be in here. And here's an example of how you go about it. Like the thing with MLflow is you're usually, it's a bit of a different flow because you're registering models that have already been trained most of the time. So you want to essentially point MySDB, well, the handler of MLflow to where it can find a living connection of MLflow serve, right? And then communicate with those models. So usually you would just, you know, train the model, you would get a, you would, sorry, get a run ID, you would serve it like this, right? You would pass the model URI. And then finally, you would create a predictor that essentially just integrates that um, model uh -huh. serving endpoint with MindsDB. Now, we are working on re refreshing this so that it's more tight-knit, um, but it still doesn't escape the fact that you have to train a model first to then bring mm -hmm. it in. Okay. This can be useful for ease of interaction. Let's say, let's say your machine learning expert trained the model, but then the ones that interact with it for data science purposes 
maybe don't have Python knowledge. So this would be a use case for it where you are able to interact with the model through SQL without having to code, without having to execute a Jupyter notebook and so on. Um, so to answer the question, the MLflow documentation is there, just go to docs.mindsdb.com and be a, like be aware we're refreshing this so it may change in the short term, mm -hmm. but yeah. Will it be possible to export to register a model from MindsDB in MLflow? Because in this example, you train a model outside and then you somehow you deploy it mm -hmm. with MLflow and then you bring it to MindsDB, right, to make predictions. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm wondering if the other way is possible too, or will be. Yeah, yeah, it would be, it would be. I mean, um, thinking of course about a local deployment with cloud, mm -hmm. it gets different because it's managed by yeah, us, right. but with a local deployment, um, you go to the configuration, like the path that was defined in the configuration file, and you will find your model artifacts. And it's ah. essentially the weights and not even the weights. It's more like the, the model instance saved as a dill or pickle uh, pickled file that you can just uh, load back again and you have the Python object there. There's other ways to save it, but that's the default one. And then for reference, you also have the Python code and the JSON AI file. So most likely you would use the instance of the model. You would train, like you would load it back. Mm -hmm. You would expose it or move it into the MLflow uh, structure or like, yeah, the file, file system. Uh, and expose it that way. Like you could certainly do it, though I would say at that point, it's better for you to just think about Lightwood more than MindsDB mm -hmm. because MindsDB is really like the enabler for databases and, and connections. If you're more interested in just exposing an AutoML model, it makes sense to go through Lightwood directly. Like from Python, you just export the model with the high level API and move it uh, to MLflow. But it's certainly possible. Thank you. Question from uh, Jorge or George, sorry if I mispronounce your name. So the question is about the these how tos that you followed. So I think I saw them in the cloud. So in the cloud, you just click the there's some sort of like the help button, right? That you just click yes. and then learning yeah. hub, right? Are they also in the docs you just showed us? Um, in the docs, we have a lot of tutorials. I am not. 100% sure if, if these two are in there. Let me... But some others are. There. So if yeah, somebody is have... looking for extra stuff, then... Let's see. So you do have them. Yeah, they're here. Okay. So these are like the official tutorials, and they are the ones in the cloud. But you also have community tutorials that have more examples, and we're always generating more. So but like hopefully you will find enough examples there to you know, dip your... Uh, test the waters, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, question from Alexei. So if what if I don't like SQL and I want to train predict using normal programming language, air quotes are added by me. So mm -hmm. can I somehow benefit from using MindsDB or should I stay away from this? Um, let's see. So if you don't like SQL, the model versioning that comes for free um, is very tight knit into, in, into actually using SQL as a, as a, as a flow. So I would probably say like even though we have a python and a javascript sdk uh, with which you can interact with the models exposed in mindsdb you could use it i'm not sure if it would be the optimal way just because um again it's thought to be interacted of or from sql you could use it but i think i would probably recommend in that case to think of something a bit simpler potentially because if you're not using sql then you lose a lot of the advantages that come with with a uh, with all the tooling that we've uh, developed, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this auto ML two was it Ludwig? It's so there, uh, there's two. You're referring to the last one? Yeah, Ludwig. Or, yeah, yeah. But the, like, it's not my point. But the, my point is like, you don't need my NCB to to use it, right? No, no. Uh, so no, Ludwig is its own thing. Lightwork uh -huh, okay. is its own thing. Right. Okay. Both both can be used independently from my NCB. Uh, both are declarative auto ML solutions. With different focuses, though, but but both are independent. So MindsDB comes when you're looking to interact with machine learning models from as close as possible to wherever your data base, data lake, data warehouse lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the comment from Eric that the fact that this supports SQL many databases and ML libraries is very powerful and was missing until now. And I agree that. Uh, like it's actually, to me, it looks like a good thing that it supports SQL because you don't need to first, uh, the, 
the usual approach, the usual flow, at least for me when I work. So I first do a SQL query. I fetch some data from the Postgres, whatever Redshift we use, right? So I fetch the data, put it on my local machine, train the model, right? And then, I don't know, do predict and then write it back to, to SQL, right? So then I kind of can save this round trip and then do the thing already on SQL. Exactly, yeah. Are there any limitations of with the size of the data? Like when, uh, how, how much uh, data can you use there? Yeah, so it's two things. On the one, on the one hand, uh, you've got the AutoML solution, which it's got its sort of independent constraints, and then there's MindsDB. MindsDB proper uses the MySQL wire protocol. So in theory, it can use however many data points you want, as long as your database supports it. Uh, the wire protocol is stable. It's fairly, you know, simple to to pass data through it. So that's fine. It's more like the AutoML engine that's behind, or rather the ML backend that's behind. Is it able to cope with that amount of, or with that volume of data? I think for the two uh, that we saw today, that's the case. It should be the case. They both should be performant. Um, it could be that in the future we support some other integrations that, for example, well, I don't know, but um, are very much compute heavy. So for example, Teapot, I think does genetic programming. Now I'm not sure what's the time nor space complexity on those algorithms, but if, if they were to be very expensive, that would mean that using MindsDB with that integration does not scale very well necessarily to 1 million rows or 2 million rows, for example. Um, so it depends on the backend that you use. Okay. Makes sense. So at the end, it's still the backend that does all the work. So you have, yeah. have to be mindful of that. Exactly. Okay. And uh, yeah, question from Andrea. If I delete data from my original table, what happens with the predictor? If you leave? Delete, delete. Delete. Delete, ah, delete, delete, like remove it. Well, um, so the training data set gets materialized when you run the generate, well, the create predictor query. So at that point in time, it's pretty much a snapshot. If after the fact, one of the columns gets deleted, it again depends on how that framework that you used is able to cope with that fact. I think both of the ones that we've shown today would be able to cope with no more columns. Like, sorry, if you delete one of those columns, it will still work because MySDB SQL will understand that in the query, if you say, for example, select star, if the table is missing a column that was there before, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's dynamic. So it will say, okay, well, uh, right now it's nine columns. Maybe it was 10 before, but right now it's nine. So let's just retrieve those nine. Let's pass those nine columns to the backend. The backend will have to figure out how to predict without that column. Once I get those predictions back, I just merge them with the table. So to give an answer, like a concrete, concrete answer, it would be, you can still use it, um, but it's on the backend, the machine learning framework to deal with that. So mileage may vary there. And question from Roberto, is it possible to run the prediction query programmatically? So I think it's like, uh, I imagine a scenario where let's say I want to, um, so I already have a trained model, I have a predictor, and then I want to, let's say, have a scheduler job, a batch job that yeah. applies the model to uh, all the data from yesterday, for example. So I think right now, native to MySDB, the answer is no. I think you can do this um, with other tools. I think, for example, DVT comes to mind, um, but we're working on making this a reality because when it comes to you know model deployment and tracking models through time for things like, uh, for example, model drift or even data drift, if you're able to schedule evaluations for the model, uh, that's super powerful because it can actually give you alerts and you can even trigger actions automatically. So we're looking into it uh, to, to be done at the native level. I believe it's possible with third-party integrations, but but yeah, like natively, it's still not there. Work mm -hmm. in progress, let's say. Okay. Yeah. And uh, just want to make sure I understand the question. So question from Kevs is how the data layer is implemented in a database. For example, SQL Server managed hosted in, uh, SQL Server hosted in Azure. Um, hmm. I think, yeah, the, the question is that then goes on. Is it G GDPR compliant? So. Good question. Um, so I think 
the way that this works is you expose the database as a connection to MySDB, um, and then everything is communicated through MySQL wire protocol. I'm not sure of the security, uh, like uh, the security, let's say, effects that this may have on stuff like GDPR. I'm not an expert, not in Europe, so uh, I'm not sure. But in terms of how the data layer interacts with MySDB, everything is done at the connection level. So pretty much like your database uh, client that you use to connect and query the whatever database you have, it's pretty much the same. We are another connection to that database and everything gets sent through there. Um, you would have to ask one of our backend engineers as for safety in the in the sharing of the data through that wire protocol. I would expect it's safe, but I'm not an expert on that area, so I'm, I'm sorry I can't really give a, a right answer here. Yeah, well, I would assume that MySQL protocol, the one you mentioned, is uh, has been battle tested for quite long. Yeah. So my assumption would be that it's quite secure, but at the end, the data still needs to travel, right? So let's say if you have yeah. your Azure in, I don't know, Ireland or some European Union state, right? And then if your mines DB instance is in uh, California, right? Then mm -hmm. the data needs to, to travel to California and then back to That's Europe. true. And it, it has implications in latency for prediction times. So if you would, I mean, probably you need to make sure that your mines DB instance lives ideally in the same region that your database mm -hmm. instance. Uh, that's that's an important point, true. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, when it comes to open source, right? Nobody stops you from hosting it in the same in the same availability zone, like in the same cloud as your database, right? You can even maybe put it inside virtual private, uh, how do you call it, VPC, like basically right. restricted network, right? So then the data doesn't actually leave the network, right? It stays, home, exactly. stays there. Yeah, that's the beauty of open source. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, I am not sure if I missed any questions. Uh, yeah, there was a comment. Um, I'm making notes and I missed a part. So everything is recorded. So even as, as we speak, you can actually rewind a little bit and uh, see it. And then, of course, the recording will stay after uh, this stream. So you can come back at any time and uh, rewatch it. And also, if you have any questions to Patricio, you can find him in MindsDB community, right? So that we have yep. a Slack link. So if you have any questions to him or to other people from MindsDB, you can just go to Slack and ask the questions there. OK, I don't see any other questions. So I don't know, any wrapping remarks, like anything you want to say? Um, I mean, just if this is slightly interesting to you guys, uh, we would love you in the community. Um, it's it's a very it's it's we try to foster you know interactions and and in general passion for machine learning. I think um, this is an area that's very much not explored at the moment, and it has potential. So we would be happy to welcome you. And and then for you, Alexi, like really thankful for giving me the space to just show you, and um, thank you to the entire Data Clubs community for the patience and the interest. Yeah, thanks. Next time, maybe you will play Titanic for us. No, oh, maybe <laughs> at the end of the stream, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have a deal, do we? Yeah, yeah, we do. Handshake, okay. virtual handshake. <laughs> OK, then, uh, yeah, I don't see any other questions popping up. So with that, I want to thank you for joining us today, for showing. I lost count how many demos, like five. Least, I think okay. something like that, a handful. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Amazing tool. Uh, I really appreciate that you're doing this in open source. So yeah, thanks for joining us today. Thank you again, Alexi.